I'm an old man now and a lonesome man in Kansas, but not afraid to speak my lonesomeness in a car, because not only my lonesomeness, it's ours all over America, oh tender fellows. And spoken lonesomeness is prophecy in the moon a hundred years ago or in the middle of Kansas now. In 1965, Allen Ginsberg received a $6,000 Guggenheim grant, and his plan was to drive across the United States with his companion, Peter Orlovsky, and record poetry. I know Alan was a world traveler, you know, but Kansas was something he wanted to see and be part of. And Wichita was a trying place because it was a center and that he wanted to learn about what the, uh, what the vortex was and how it uh, produced so many creative people coming out there. Renowned by some, condemned by others, Poet Allen Ginsberg became world famous in the 1960s for his avant-garde writing and unconventional lifestyle. Sex, politics, religion, drugs. Ginsberg took on traditional beliefs that many held sacred and challenged mainstream American culture like never before. On January 29, 1966, Ginsburg quietly rolled into Wichita in his Volkswagen van. Over the next few weeks, he saw the sights, met the people, and pushed the limits of what many in this white bread conservative city considered socially acceptable. Most people would, would be just as happy if he didn't show up in good old Wichita, definitely. And even today, I think the same thing would hold true. It forced the police and the officials to take a long, hard look at what is, in fact, free speech and, and what is the harm in it. Ginsburg's visit to Wichita was the latest chapter in a story that began more than a decade earlier. He recognized Wichita as of greater importance than just, you know, the largest city in Kansas. It had a national beat to it. And, uh, he wanted to see where all the people who were out in San Francisco, where they'd come from. Those people included artist Bruce Connor and poets Michael McClure and David Hazelwood. They were a trio of Wichita University students in the 1950s who set their sights on San Francisco and a different way of life. These were people who did not see the three kids station wagon and home in the suburbs as the life they wanted to live. They had other plans and it involved art and it involved literature and it involved a, uh, a personality that we would recognize more as maybe the hippie generation that followed them. But they were not long hair. They worked. They had jobs at Boeing Beach and Cessna at college and uh, drank a lot and uh, had parties and were, they were just bright. They would become prominent members of a small but increasingly visible counterculture known as the Beats. The movement traces its beginnings to Ginsburg, novelist Jack Kerouac, and poet Herbert Hunky. They called themselves, when they referred to it at all, as Beats. And that was a term that Ginsburg claims Jack Kerouac and uh, I believe Herbert Hunky came up with in 1948 when they were at Columbia. And it meant alternatively a downtrodden person, a person used, and it referred to, according to Jack Kerouac, beatific, beatified, which is very interesting. The thing that drove the beats was that they were a reaction to an industrial 
conforming culture that was so prevalent. You have to understand that after World War II, there was a real fear that we'd go back into depression. And so when prosperity hits in, the society embraces this idea of fitting in, working for a company, working for a corporation, getting a good job, getting a good house, settling down, and providing a stability that, that they had not seen, certainly as children in the 20s and 30s. The younger generation now starts thinking, well, maybe that's not really what we want. The beat culture prevalent in California expressed ideas and discontent creatively and inspired, as it turned out, a growing number of young restless Kansans with a bent for the arts. It was a cold scene back then. The John Birch Society was real big in Wichita. It was straight, you know, ROTC land. It was pretty rough around here. If you were the least bit different in the city of Wichita, Kansas, and they wonder why everybody left, that's why everybody left. People were all over you. A lot of educated families moved into Wichita during the World War II years, and their kids were well educated. And the education system here at the time apparently appears to be fairly good. They were into literature. All of them realized their, their goals and ambitions and their happiness lie elsewhere. Soon, an entire contingent of young Wichita men had migrated westward. They were often found in the company of Ginsburg and the other Beats who frequented places such as San Francisco's City Lights Bookstore and the coffee houses and bars that held poetry readings and showcased avant-garde art. If you talk about my artwork, you're going to be talking about a lot of different stuff. Bob Branneman arrived there from Wichita in 1959. It was a period of time when we thought about changing the more conventional uptight things and loosening things, you know, uh, sexual morals, uh, art. Uh, I mean, when I first went to San Francisco, I saw a black man walking barefooted with a beautiful blonde lady. Back in Kansas in 59, he would have been in big trouble. You didn't walk down the street with a beautiful white girl if you were black. I mean, uh, things were at a different time in history. Now in his early 80s, Branneman lives in Santa Monica, California. He still creates the kind of art that was often ridiculed and condemned by conservative America in the 1950s and 60s. The Beats influenced culture in, in, in so many ways, you know. Uh, I, uh, at the time, we knew we were influencing culture because we could see there were changes. But the Beats sort of uh, pointed the way to the East and, and towards the spirit. I mean, artists, to me, the artist's job is to bring the spirit down. And that's what these poets and painters and artists did, writers. Um, to, to uh, awaken the spiritual uh, qualities in America, which America needs. People need that, you know? It's not all material. I mean, it, the material and the spirit are one, but if you just focus on having a car, having money, having all the things society tells you you need, suddenly you see it doesn't fill the hole. There's more, you need everything. You need the balance. Um, the Buddha said it's not inside, it's not outside. Well, where the hell is it then? I guess it's in between. Branneman became friends with Charles Plymel when the two briefly shared a cell in the Sedgwick County Jail in the early 50s. Plymel was a high school dropout with a flair for the written word and a passion for jazz music. In Wichita, uh, I was mainly just... Uh, an outcast, and we sort of had our own uh, group in, uh, as a hipster in Wichita. And uh, of course, we uh, all got along fine. We'd go to clubs. Plymel was 16 years old when his father gave him a new 1951 Chevy 
which he drove to the West Coast on several occasions along Route 66. Plymel would later nickname the road Benzedrine Highway in one of his famous books of poetry and prose. Eventually, Plymel moved to San Francisco in 1962, adding to the number of Kansans immersed in beat culture. In fact, they were hesitant to mention they were from Kansas till I went out and thinked them off. They thought they, you know, would be regarded as a hick out in liberal San Francisco or something. Plymel was soon getting his work published. But back in Wichita, it was apparently hard to find. Plymel wrote this letter to the editor in 1964, complaining that Wichita police had ordered one of his poetry magazines removed from the shelves at Moody Skid Row Beanery. Moody's was a cafe and bookstore on Douglas Avenue that held poetry readings and embraced new ideas. Plymel claimed the magazine was well received on both coasts and Wichita police were breaking the law by ordering it removed. This was just one example of the conflict that existed between the Beats and traditional Americans. By this time, American culture was referring to the Beats as Beatniks. Herb Kahn, uh, uh, an editorial writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, who didn't particularly like the movement, started calling them Beatniks in his columns. And this was a spin-off of the Russian Sputnik, or Peacenik. It was a derogatory term. Our subject for today is how to be a Beatnik. Some people think the Beatnik is merely a bum with sunglasses, but he is more than that, though not much. By 1959, they were mainstreamed with Dobie Gillis of Maynard G. Krebs. Did you give Poppy the message? Yeah, man. You told her it was an emergency? Oh, like life and death, man. Well, I'm just gonna be here like in two minutes. Good lad. Uh, Maynard, you ought to get yourself a girl. Oh, not me, Big Daddy. I've tried girls and it's like nowhere. They spend my money, they won't kiss me goodnight, and they giggle about me in the powder room. Uh, you try girls if you wanna. Me, I'm sticking to jazz. It was not true. They did not all wear berets. They did not all wear gray sweatshirts. They did not all have goatees. That is a image created by the media. But the stereotype of the lazy, indulgent, indignant beatnik became ingrained in American media. They call you beat generation. Think you live as you choose. Oh, you beat generation. I think you headed for the blues. This is only for the cool cats. The sterile creeps can crawl out now. Upon a certain birthday, dear parents, we do not thank you, dear fumbling mother and father, both, upon this miserable occasion. We give you offerings of respectful loathing. There had been a Life magazine article in 59, that's kind of famous, which looked down on the beats, but did so in a way that made you kind of want to be one of them. You know, that they were wasting time, they were partying, they drank too much, they smoked marijuana, you know, things like that. So I think that's the point that people failed to see. There was always work involved. There was always practicing. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't that they woke up one morning and suddenly could paint or write poetry. You know, they, they had to work at it. And that's overlooked a lot, I think. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, who cowered in unshaven rooms in underwear, burning their money in waste baskets and listening to the terror through the wall, who copulated ecstatic and insatiate with a bottle of beer, a sweetheart, a package of cigarettes, a candle, and fell off the bed, and continued along the floor and down the hall and ended fainting on the wall with a vision of ultimate c and c eluding the last c of consciousness. Ginsburg himself felt language was free. Language was sacred. 
And these images had meaning and power and substance to him. He didn't write them for somebody else. He wrote them for himself. And they, they are shocking in their language, even today. And that's why the police showed up at the readings. And in 1966, Wichita police would confront Ginsburg about the language in his poetry. This crisis over public speech arose in the middle of Ginsburg's journey across America. By this time, the concept of the Wichita Vortex had become legend throughout the beat community. The Vortex was a descriptive term applied to Wichita by Bruce Connor, Michael McClure, and David Hazelwood, describing a place that held them there as aliens, would not let them go in a place that did not like them. The vortex has a lot of energy, but you have to leave it or it will kill you. He wanted to learn about what the uh, what the vortex was and how, how it produced so many creative people coming out of there. Plymel was back in Wichita visiting when Ginsburg and his boyfriend Peter Orlovsky arrived. In San Francisco, we talked about he he was coming back uh, back east and he wanted to see Wichita, and uh, I was going back east too. And I said, "Well, hey, I'll meet you." So I gave him my mother's address and phone number, and uh, he and uh, Peter Orlovsky drove out, and he stayed. Quite a while there, we would go places and someone gave him a room there. That initial visit lasted a week, during which Ginsburg did an interview with the Wichita Eagle. Ginsburg told the reporter that Wichita should be proud of the talent it produces, but he added, all of this beautiful energy and talent is apparently of no use to Wichita and gets dispersed to other cities. Wichita has become synthesized to its own cultural degradation. As a result, the youngsters feel a kind of hopelessness. The only way out they see is leaving. On February 10th, Ginsburg and Plymel traveled to Lawrence for a poetry reading at the University of Kansas. The event got major coverage in Life magazine, which reported that Ginsburg received star treatment, his work praised by students and faculty alike. Then he said, well, I have a reading in Lincoln, Nebraska. So we got in the bus and headed out for Lincoln, Nebraska. He read at Lincoln big formal university reading. Then yes. I think we came back to Wichita. Then he must have read the sutra there. The Wichita Vortex Sutra is a poem Ginsburg composed by dictating into a tape recorder during his travels in and around Kansas. Well, the Wichita Vortex poem is, is a great accomplishment, I feel. I feel it in, in many ways mirrors all of America at that time. The poem itself, though, was very much about what he saw in Wichita when he was here, including uh, the gay bar he was at. It's not the vast plains mute our mouths that fill at midnight with ecstatic language when our trembling bodies hold each other breast to breast on a mattress. Not the empty sky that hides the feeling from our faces, nor our skirts and trousers that conceal the body love emanating in a glow of beloved skin. White, smooth abdomen down to the hair between our legs. Quite honestly, you have to be moved by his descriptive use of language. He's a master wordsmith. It's why he's internationally famous. It's why there are courses offered on his work in every major university in the world. But at the time, the chair of the English department at Wichita University wanted nothing to do with Ginsburg. We went over and he slammed the door in our face. So that didn't work out. So uh, another uh, friend there in the philosophy department invited him to read at Wichita U. That's how he read there. 
But before the event at Wichita U, Ginsburg took part in poetry readings at the Magic Theater Vortex Art Gallery and then the Showboat Lounge. That's where police showed up. The police were going to arrest him for reading poetry at a folk club called the Showboat. Actually, it was Ginsburg's protege, Robert Engel, who was reading a poem to the crowd when a police officer interrupted. I remember that part pretty vivid. They rolled up in a squat car, they came in. They were gonna sit there and listen to it to see if they could haul him in for obscenity. Alan was uh, ready for them, and so they said, well, let me talk to the chief, and he went out to the squad car, got on the radio with the chief of police in Wichita, and the chief of police said, well, they're doing it all over the country, I guess it's all right. So the cops sat there and, and w waited through the reading, and that was that. Vice Squad Chief Bobby Stout says police ultimately treated the poets appropriately. They were doing things that we weren't accustomed to see people doing, and that, uh, that's why everybody's scratching their head. Well, what's, what's going on? It was poetry. I didn't think it was very good poetry, but it was poetry. Ginsburg and his ilk uh, were, were trailblazers in that regard. What can you say? What does the First Amendment guarantee you to say? And we, where everybody was stumbling around, trying to figure out exactly to what you could and could not do. But the controversy didn't end there. Six days later, Ginsburg arrived for his reading at Wichita U. The Dean of Liberal Arts threatened to have Ginsburg arrested for trespassing if Ginsburg's language went out of the bounds of propriety. Wichita State prided itself on being, though, a voice of conscience, a voice of change in society to a degree. The elder faculty were not so sure about someone like Ginsburg. The youth thought Ginsburg was fantastic. On February 21st, 1966, with police in the audience, Ginsburg read portions of his newly composed Wichita Vortex Sutra. Chilling bombing range mapped in the distance. Crime prevention show sponsored by Wrigley Spearmint. Much delight in weeping, ecstasy in singing. Laughter rises that confound staring idiot mayors and stony politicians eyeing thy breast. Oh, man of America, be born! Alan enjoyed very much coming to Wichita and, and uh, seeing some of the places where McClure and Bruce Connors and Dave Hazelwood, myself and Charlie Plymel grew up. But he weaves in so much of the poem. The poem's like a sort of travelogue for the whole uh, center of America, which is what the vortex is. It's, it, the vortex is something of immense energy that bespeaks of America and radiates out and in. And uh, I think Ginsburg captures some of that in his poem. I think it's a very important poem of his. It's a great poem and uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm part of it and was part of, that Ginsburg was part of my life because uh, he really helped change my life and influence my life. A Life magazine reporter and a film crew were there to document any controversy. Ginsburg warned the audience at the outset to leave if they did not want to hear language they might find offensive. While it's not clear what else Ginsburg read at Wichita U, it reportedly did include language many would have considered obscene. He, he made a point, I think, of, of shocking the shockers, I guess you'd say. Nevertheless, the reading went on without incident. Ginsburg had pushed the limits and prevailed. Some say setting a precedent that brought an end to censorship of speech in Wichita, at least openly. But it wasn't just Ginsburg. The beat movement with its contingent of creative, free-spirited Wichitans had helped usher in a new era of openness. You didn't have to like what they were saying to benefit from the freedom they helped bring about 
half a century ago. Preserver Hare Krishna, returning in the age of pain. Sacred heart, my Christ acceptable. Allah, the compassionate one. Yahweh, righteous one. All knowledge princes of earth, man. All ancient seraphim of heavenly desire. Devas, yogis, and holy men I chant to. Come to my lone presence into this vortex named Kansas. I love